Okay, as I said before, this is uh, the introductory lecture. You'll notice on the timetable that the lab is split up into three sessions. That is PS1, PS2 and PS3. Uh, PS2 and PS3 are going to be the hands-on sessions in which from the beginning you'll be split up into breakout rooms, one for each of the groups, uh, and demonstrators will be on hand to, to help answer any questions and, uh, uh, and guide you through the exercises. In the last session, uh, we'll also be able to do a, a walkthrough of our model solution for the final exercise. That said, PS2 and PS3 are repeated uh, to try and cover all of the time zones. But if you can't make PS2, uh, then feel free just to join for PS3. They're, they're both going to contain the same thing, more or less. Um, and also feel free to work on these outside of these breakout rooms. Uh, the Slack channel is there for you to um, discuss the exercises with the other students, but also the demonstrators will be answering questions there, both during and after the school. Um, by the way, during this talk and the future talks, please ask any questions you have directly into the chat or just say hello. Hi, Giorgio. And uh, uh, those will be answered either as I go through or at the end, I'll pick out some questions and, and answer them there. figure this out. Okay, so the goal of this lab, this introductory lecture, is first of all just to try and explain to you what is domain independent planning, uh, to give you some basic formalisms, and then uh, to get you some hands-on experience modelling planning problems. Uh, the outline of the talk is first of all just a, the most high-level introduction, followed by an introduction to the formalism that we use, which is PDDL, the Planning Domain Definition Language. Uh, then we'll look at the lab materials, in specifically the online editor, uh, and then a closer look at exercise four, which includes time and numbers. So the first section is on domain automated, domain independent automated planning. Okay, so the short definition, what is planning? Planning to me is one of the uh, key indicators of intelligence. Uh, in short, it is the act of thinking before acting, the deliberation that you take in order to decide what to do before you actually do it. Uh, a slightly better definition would be that it's the process of choosing and organizing actions that lead you towards your goal based on a high level description of the world. So a couple of important points there, leading you towards the goal doesn't necessarily mean that you know for sure that the actions you're taking uh, are going to do that. And uh, based on this high level description of the world means I must have some idea of what the, the outcome of the actions I'm taking might be. I've, I've introduced this as domain independent planning. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well. Domain specific planning uses representations or methods that are adapted to solving specific problems. Uh, and some of the lectures this week are going to cover exactly this. We're going to look at some path and motion planning, manipulation planning, and so on. When I'm talking about domain independent planning, which is the focus of this lab, uh, I mean that we're going to be using a general representation, representation that doesn't make many assumptions about the type of problem or the domain that it's going to be applied to. Even within domain independent planning though, you'll find that there are many different flavors of planning. So for example, are you planning online or offline? Online meaning we're reading the state and making choices about our actions as we are applying those actions and making new observations. Is the world discrete? like a game of chess in which we make turns, or is it more continuous in which there are continuous rates of change and processes? Are the actions we're taking deterministic and we know the outcome if we apply the action or they are non, are they non deterministic? And is the world fully or partially observable to us? And finally, are we dealing with, uh, well, I, I mentioned discrete and continuous. It's slightly different from sequential and temporal. Sequential meaning I take my actions one at a time, 
temporal meaning my actions have durations and I can uh, I can um, apply my actions perhaps concurrently overlapping with one another whereas discrete and continuous also refers to other real numbered variables such as for example the rate at which I might consume a fuel uh, oh I should mention as well discrete and continuous can refer to discrete and continuous probabilities but these are topics for the the future speakers this week. Okay, and finally, what is automated planning used for? This is a, a slide that I give to some undergraduates uh, last year, a screenshot of uh, a few of the different projects I've been a part of in which we've actually applied domain independent automated planning. So obviously we have robotics there, but it's actually a, a very widely applicable technique uh, in the top corner, for example, we have domain independent planning applied uh, to provide situational awareness for operators in a control room, uh, looking at uh, real time data from ships. We have power grid management. Um, in the bottom left there, we have automated planning for urban traffic control, which includes a lot of uncertainty and continuous change. So that's the very high level description of what is planning. Uh, now let's look at the formalism that we're going to be using during this lab, which is the planning domain definition language. In this formalism, the main components of the um, planning problem are first a description of how the world behaves. This is what we'll use uh, as our world description to simulate the future and decide what to do. A description of the initial situation, our initial state from which we start, and a description of what our desired situation is, that is the goal. And this is broken down into this tuple F, A, I and G, where F is a set of Boolean propositions that describe the state of the world. A is our set of deterministic actions, which describe how the world can be changed. Uh, the set of states is induced from these set of propositions, it's the power set of those propositions, and one of those is our initial state. And finally, the goal is a function which describes whether or not any state satisfies our goal. Uh, this is the most basic representation of planning here, where we have deterministic actions, we only have Boolean propositions to describe the world, and uh, we also have the assumption here that the world is not going to change in any other way except for the actions that we are applying. It's also fully observable. Our initial state is a complete state. Uh, and each action in this model consists of a set of preconditions. This is the, um, the set of facts that must be true in order for us to be able to apply an action in a state and then a set of add effects and delete effects. The add effects are those facts which become true after we apply the action and the set of facts which become false after we apply the action. So let's have a look at an example of this to get a sort of clearer intuition. In PDDL, the examples are written into two files. First of all, the domain file and the problem file. If you've been working a little bit on the exercises already, then you'll have seen this. The domain file includes the predicates and operators of the problem and the problem file includes the objects, the initial state and the goal. Now importantly, in the definition I gave you before, I said that there was a set of propositional facts that describe our states and a set of actions which you can apply. Whereas in the domain file, actually you write this in the first order logic of predicates and operators. So predicates take in some parameters, some terms, which are those objects and applying those terms to the predicates will result in generating all of your facts and all of, uh, all of your actions. So let's have a look. This is the example of the simple switches domain in which we have uh, one type of object, types are optional, uh, which is switch. And we define two predicates here, off and on, both of which take one parameter, one term of type switch and we define one operator and again it takes a parameter one parameter of type switch 
the precondition, remember, is the fact that must be true in order for this action to be applied. And in this case, you cannot apply this action unless the switch is off. And the effect describes both the add and the delete effects here. We have one delete effect, which is that um, after you apply this action, the switch is no longer off. That fact is removed from the state and the fact on is added to the state. So this is the domain file, which includes both the predicates and the operators. The problem file instead includes a set of objects, the initial state and the goal state. So in this case, the initial state is that all three of our switches are off and the goal state is for all three of the switches to be switched on. So quite a, a simple problem. One thing you might notice is that by splitting our description of the problem into these two parts, into the domain and the problem, uh, we've enabled uh, the ability to reuse this domain description for many different problems. And that's something we're going to be looking at in the next session on um, plan-based control for robots is that uh, while the, the initial state, the goal, and even the objects might change quite a lot, the operators and the predicates that describe the world often stay the same. And so we can keep the same domain and continually update the problem file in order to be able to solve many different uh, problems or, or replan on the robot. So given a domain and a problem, a plan for this um, problem instance is a sequence of actions that are applicable from the initial state and satisfy the goal. So in this case, you just need to switch on all three switches. All right, I'll just check to see if there's any questions about that before I uh, move on to the next part, which is to take you through the planning.domains. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, yes, the slides will be made available as well as the recording. Uh, there'll be a new page on the website shortly. Salah asks, where do planning algorithms like MCTS, A-star, and et cetera, fit into this picture? It's a very good question. So one thing this lab isn't really covering is how do you solve planning problems? But that's uh, something I think we can talk about, which is how, how do you find this plan in the first place? Let me go back a moment just to this slide here. This will do. And point out this set of states here as well as this set of deterministic actions. These actions and states induce a transition, um, what do you call it, a state transition problem, in which the initial state is one node in this network of states. The actions are edges which connect states together or transitions between states. And the goal is a set of accepting states that we want to move to. Phrase like this, our planning problem is a search problem in which we're searching through transitions to find a sequence of transitions that will lead us from the initial state to the goal state. Uh, Monte Carlo tree search, A star search, these are search algorithms that are applicable to planning in this, um, in this formalism. Now, one of the reasons planning is a hard problem is that the the set of states here, as you can see, it's exponential in the number of facts that we have to describe our state. Um, and in fact, if we consider that the domain is already expressed in first order logic, the set of facts is already um, an exponential explosion from our number of object terms. So in the end, we end up with a, a search problem that is p-space complete, or in other words, it's very hard. Um, some of the talks you'll see this week will be uh, giving you a bit more information about how you might solve these problems. Uh, but there are a few different approaches, as well as things like MCTS and A-star search. Uh, there's a lot of 
good research on what kind of heuristics you can do to guide search in order to tackle the, the complexity of this problem uh, and other techniques as well, such as um, uh, uh, a translation of a bounded planning problem into, into satisfiability or constraint satisfaction problems so that you can run uh, more classic constraint optimization solvers on it. Someone says it must be um, easier than P-space complete because we can use SAT solvers. So you'll notice I said that we can translate bounded planning problems into SAT. In order to apply a SAT solver to the planning problem, you must first translate it into a, a set of SAT variables and constraints. And if you know the number of SAT variables, that means you're basically saying that you know the length of the plan in advance. And it, you can prove that, in fact, if you are able to find finding the number of steps that are required for the plan is just as hard as finding the plan itself. Um, so therefore, the, these approaches which use SAT solvers guess what the bound of the plan might be. We say, well, let's try a plan that has 10 actions. And then you pass this to the SAT solver. If it's successful, then you don't know that it was the minimum number of steps, but you can move, you can try a tighter bound. And if it's unsuccessful, you don't know that the problem's unsolvable, you just know that the bound was maybe too short. Uh, but yes, this is it's a good question. Someone else asks, how can we be sure that the plan we've got from PDDL is optimal? In the PDDL that I'm about to introduce here, sort of classical planning, um, optimality probably means the fewest number of steps. We're looking at sequential actions and there are no action costs here or action costs are uniform. In order to show that we've got the minimum number of steps, we just need to perform a, a, an exhaustive search to show that there is no plan that has a smaller number of steps. Um, yeah, there's also another answer in the chat there. Later on, we'll be looking at temporal PDDL and uh, there's a talk later this week about temporal and numeric planning. As we start to move towards that, proving optimality becomes very hard indeed. And in practice, I, I generally find that it's good enough to have a solution of high quality rather than proving it's the optimal solution. OK, let's take a look at the online editor. So this is uh, planning.domains, which was created by a team, including Christian Muse, who I want to um, thank for uh, helping me out with this lab and getting a temporal planner working on short notice. Uh, it's been very useful. The editor allows you to write PDDL directly into your browser with syntax highlighting and also pass it to a solver. It also has a various other plugins which sort of make easier the task of writing PDDL. Um, I'll show you online a little example of how to use it in case you haven't tried it already. I believe I'm able to just, there we go. So you now should be able to see the, um, oh no, not yet. There we go. You should now be able to see the planning.domains editor. Let me know if you can't. Brilliant. And here we have uh, exactly the domain and problem I was showing in the example here. So we have these types, which are switch, these predicates for on and off, um, and this action which switches the switch on. You can see that it has this one parameter, this one precondition off, and this effect. In the problem, as before, we have three switches um, which are initially off and the, and the goal is to switch them on. So note that here I've defined two operators, switch off and switch on, but the number of actions we have in this problem will actually be six. There are three switch on actions, one for each switch and three switch off actions. Uh, similarly, I've defined two predicates, which is going to mean that there are six propositional facts. 
and two to the power of six possible states. Okay, so in order to solve it, we just click the solve button. You can select which domain and which problem you want to, to plug in and uh, just hit plan. And we get this plan as output. It's very nice. You can see, in fact, here is the action with all of the parameters filled in. So we have switch one is being switched on, switch two is being switched on, and switch three is being switched on. Okay. Let me switch back to the slides. Okay, you should you should see the slides now. Uh, here are these, the links to the different uh, example solutions we have for exercise uh, one in the in the lab, which is just asking you to to practice a bit with PDDL uh, and try um, adding a few more objects, adding a few more actions, and and changing the preconditions for these actions. In particular, with the tricky switches, uh, make sure you you try to run the planner on your problem check through the plan and make sure that it's what you expect. Uh, this should be fairly easy to do with the tricky switches. As the problem gets more complex, um, validating that the plan is what you might expect becomes a little bit more difficult. So for example, with the logistics problem, when you start to add um, temporal constraints, things you might want to check for is, is it possible for the driver to start disembarking from a truck and the truck to start driving away at the same time? Your plans may end up being valid, but when you read them, they might not make any sense. Or is it possible for the driver to get out of a truck, for the truck to drive, and then for the driver to get out of the truck again, resulting in two copies of the same driver? The, uh, although intuitively that's obviously wrong, um, it's very easy to make this sort of mistake when planning. And that's the reason why I want you to have some experience modeling planning domains and trying out these problems. Okay. Has anybody uh, tried out the solver and run into, so tried out the online editor and run into any problems and have any questions about that? If not, I'll leave that until the hands-on part of this lab and we can just talk instead about temporal planning. Okay. Someone asked, can we choose the background solver or is there only one? It'd be interesting to try different solvers. Definitely would be interesting. As far as I'm aware, there's only one um, uh, classical solver and one temporal solver at the moment. Uh, although you can obviously try the temporal solver on the classical problems, you can't the other way around. There are other solvers. There's also instructions on planning.domains for how to link your own solver. Uh, but I think the easiest way to try many different solvers would be to download them and, uh, and run them yourself. Typically, you'll need to use a Linux machine. What about the quality of plans? Okay, the quality of plans I should talk about then. Especially when it comes to the temporal plans, I don't believe there's any optimization being done. So if you're getting a plan, what we're doing is satisficing planning. We're finding a plan as quickly as possible. In the case of temporal planning, the planner is given 10 seconds to plan. And if it takes longer than that to find a solution, the process is killed and it will return an error. Uh, I've seen that error a few times. It's, it, it's not very informative an error. It just says an error happened. Usually what that means is, um, especially if you waited 10 seconds, that the, the process timed out. Um, if you're getting that a lot, you might consider uh, downloading and trying a planner offline so that you can give it a little bit more time. 10 seconds, uh, even, even for the larger problems, that's just the, um, uh, the way in which the online solver has been set up. Uh, although 10 seconds can solve a problem that's definitely larger than I would be willing to try solve by hand. Uh, We can have a look at some, uh, some of those plans in a minute. So let's take a, a quick look then at uh, the temporal planning. 
Okay, um, Sala Vasidis Georgios just posted an error message to the chat. Uh, I think that might very well be the error that you get if it uh, is killed after 10 seconds, especially if you hit solve and it waits for some time before giving you that error. That's definitely what's going on there. Yo Yang asks, can we, we cannot introduce probabilistic effects in PDEDL. That's correct. Um, there are other formalisms for which you can introduce probabilistic effects. Um, for example, PPDDL, probabilistic PDDL, um, but, uh, and RDDL. And there is a talk later this week from Scott Sanna on probabilistic planning uh, in which he'll introduce that. Let's have a look at a let's have a look at a temporal problem. Okay, you should be able to see the online editor again. Let, let me know if you can't. Um, this is a, a different problem which includes uh, durative actions. Now I'm going to go through in this section the difference between the classical planning problems and the durative problems. Um, but this is in what we call PDDL 2.1, which uh, adds a few extra features such as durative actions and allows us to specify uh, temporal planning problems. This problem is about fixing a fuse in the cellar, uh, but in order to fix the fuse, we need light. So first of all, we need to light a match and we have to fix the fuse while the match is burning. So the action light match has a duration of eight seconds and mend fuse has a duration of five seconds or five time units if you prefer. Uh, in the temporal planner, when we hit solve, you'll see that there's a different uh, planner in the cloud here. We're looking at the POPF planner. And uh, when we plan, we can actually view the, the solution on this timeline viewer. Here it is, which gives us the solutions a nice Gantt chart here. So this plan means that at zero seconds, we light the match, the first match. We have two fuses, two matches. The goal is only to mend the first fuse. Uh, at time zero, we also light the second match. We're going to light them both at the same time. Uh, these actions don't have cost, so there's no reason not to. At time three, we begin mending the fuse and that takes five seconds. So we end up finishing fixing the fuse exactly as the light of the match goes out. And, uh, if you hover over these bars, you can actually see the actions which are being performed and their durations. So this is a really nice plugin. Uh, that lets you really inspect the kinds of plans you're getting. And of course, this is a very simple problem, but on the more complex problems, uh, it's quite useful. So I believe I have a, a, a version of the logistics domain with temporal. Uh, so this is the, the example solution to make the logistics domain a temporal one. If we plan here, we'll end up with a, a plan that it, it's already getting to the point where I won't want to do this by hand. Uh, and this is a sort of simple temporal solution here. We've got a lot of things working on concurrently, uh, but the actions themselves are not quite, not very interesting yet. They're all the same duration. Okay. So let's take a look at the actual syntax for this and what it means for writing PDDL. So as I said, up until now, we've used classical planning. Time is a sequence of states. Actions are instantaneous. If we want to be able to model multiple things happening at the same time, it's necessary to model duration and concurrency of actions and events. These actions and events can have complex interdependencies which determine which combinations of things are possible. For example, maybe it's possible to unload multiple packages from the truck in parallel, but not while the truck is also driving away. Uh, there are 
two books I would recommend about this subject. Of course, there's Automated Planning Theory and Practice, which has uh, a chapter specifically on this topic. And more recently, there is the book An Introduction to the Planning Domain Definition Language, uh, which is exactly everything you need to know to write PDDL. In addition, there's a couple of online resources. There's planning.domains, the online editor, of course. Uh, there's also a planning wiki, which is being written by a PhD student in King's College uh, that has a, an excellent reference on quite a lot of PDDL. It's still being built, um, but from there, you'll be able to find not only a reference to the syntax, um, but also uh, a list of planners and some links to different planners that you can try to download and, and try out. Okay, so PDDL 2.1 extends the expressiveness of PDDL to these more realistic problems, more realistic in the sense that in the real world actions have durations. Um, we're looking at adding numeric variables, optimization metrics to our problem, and durative actions. Uh, the paper that describes this uh, extension in detail and the syntax is, is there and you can check the slides later. So before we had F, A, I and G, the set of facts, actions, the initial state and the goal, but now our planning problem becomes F, V, A, I and G, where F is still our set of Boolean propositions, but we also have this set V of real primitive numeric expressions. Uh, what I might call the functions of the planning problem. This splits the state into our propositional part, our logical part, and also a numeric part. These are, these are real numbers. Uh, our set A is no longer a set of instantaneous actions, uh, but it's going to be a set of durative actions. They're still deterministic. Uh, I is our initial state and goal is our goal function as before. So as I said, the state is now a combination of both Boolean and numeric variables. So S is a tuple of S logical and S numeric, and every state can also be timestamped with a, um, a real number. This is the time at which that state is, um, that snapshot of the world is taken. Okay. And yes, so one thing I note here on this slide, you'll see that S numeric, um, is a mapping to the real numbers plus the undefined value. Um, if you don't specify a real, an initial value for one of the, the functions, uh, then it will be undefined. Some planners will assume that those undefined functions should take the value zero at the initial state, but um, you have to be careful because that's not uh, the semantics of PDDL, that's just the semantics of the planner, the implementation that you're using. Okay, so here's a quick example of an initial state with functions. We're now able to specify these equality symbol there, meaning an assignment of the value 100 to the function fuel level of the truck. Now, given these numbers, a durative action is going to consist of not just the action name and its parameters, we've added also a duration constraint and the conditions and effects, rather than just being a simple condition of what must be true in the state, it's now split up into what must be true in the state at the start of the action to apply it, what must be true over the whole duration of the action and what must be true at the end of the action. So, for example, if I'm unloading a package from a truck, at the start of that action, the package has to be in the truck. And over all of that action, the truck has to be in the location I'm doing the unloading. Uh, and in this case, there probably isn't an at end condition for me. Similarly, the effects are going to be split into at start overall and at end effects. What happens as soon as I start applying the action? And what happens at the end of the action. Actually, I don't think there was any overall effects in PDL 2.1. If you want continuous change throughout the action, then you might have to move to uh, the next level of, of formalism. So I mentioned the duration is a constraint, not just a number. Um, you actually specify 
uh, something like that the duration could be less than or greater than some number or in, inf in general any numeric expression. Uh, so comparisons uh, between numeric expression expressions are written like this. You can see you could write uh, arbitrarily complex expressions this way. And effects can be used to modify uh, functions using uh, by numeric expressions, you can have decrease, you can also have increase and assign. Uh, again, the, the reference wiki that I linked is a good place to find all of the syntax, either that or the paper or the book, if you have it. Um, here is an example of a duration constraint. What we're saying here is the duration of this action is equal to the distance between these, I'm assuming, locations from and to, divided by the speed of the thing that's moving. So they easy way to define your uh, duration as a um, function of distance and speed. Okay, let's take, just before we look at the example of syntax, I want to speak a little bit more about this duration constraint. So I mentioned that you could set the duration to be greater than some value. So I could say, for example, that I want the duration to be greater than 10 seconds, but less than 30 seconds. Now, intuitively, that sounds like I'm saying that I don't know exactly how long it's going to take, but it's between 10 and 30 seconds. I'm defining a kind of uncertainty over the duration of the action. That's not the semantics of PDDL. Actually, in PDDL, what I'm saying is that I can still choose the duration of the action, and those are the constraints that I have to abide by as the planner. The planner is free to find any plan that's valid that, that satisfies all of the conditions of all of the actions um, and the duration of that action can be picked in between those two time points. It's a subtle difference but it's important. Okay so here's a here's a durative action. As you can see now we've got uh, not just the parameters which are the same as before, we also have this duration constraint we have this condition split up into at start and overall effect um, conditions and an at end effect. So the name is as before, although very easy thing to do is to forget to change action into durative action in the uh, in the start of the line there. Parameters are the same and they can be typed. Uh, you know about types already. Duration constraints are expressed as a comparison. Oh, I'll answer that one right now. Irfana, sorry, Irfansha asks, are the time steps integers? Are the durations integers? Time is real valued in this, so you can have real numbers there. Duration constraints are expressed as comparisons in this way. You can have all the normal comparison operators. Uh, numeric expressions can be made up from constant values from the PDDL functions, uh, the unary negative operator, or any of these binary operations, plus, minus, times, and divide. Okay, this is, as I said before, your at start, at end, and overall conditions uh, must be true at the start, uh, over the whole duration of the action, and at the end of the action. Now, there's a, uh, a small um, semantic of PDL I'd like to draw out here as well, which is epsilon separation. Suppose I had an action that makes an at end a fact true and another action which requires that fact at start. In the semantics of PDDL, it's not valid for the end of one action to perfectly coincide with the, the start of the next. Instead, they must be separated by a tiny amount of time. So a way to think about that is, let's say the second action is unloading a package from a truck and the first action was loading the package into the truck. I want to load the package in and the end effect of that action is that the um, the package is in the truck. Um, 
the, the at start condition of the next action is that the package is in the truck. Now, if those two time points, the end of the first action and the start of the second, uh, were instant, they were simultaneous, then there would be um, no no time point at which the package was actually in the truck. There must have been at least some time point that the package was in that truck. And since time is real valued, we could actually say there must have been some interval um, during which the package was in the truck. And that satisfied the condition of my action. This is a, it, it seems like I'm being quite pedantic about my, my plan validity in this case, but it, it really comes in handy when you start thinking about how you can plan for the activities of, let's say, a, a robot or in general, some implemented system. There is going to be some time taken up in the code processing observations and uh, um, executing actions. And uh, in, in this case, there is going to be some time taken observing that a fact become, may become true before you can execute the action. You don't want the validity of your plan to rest upon the fact that you can do things exactly simultaneously, because in the real world, it's not so easy to do that. Okay. Uh, Al asks, we cannot introduce arbitrary mathematical expressions, right? Uh, well, you can get uh, very complex with the mathematical expressions. Um, something that you you can't do. Uh, typically can't do is to uh, start expressing uh, non-linear, um, making non-linear expressions for the duration of actions, uh, as this will cause the plan validator to be unable to validate the plan. Uh, but I think maybe experiment with that and see what's, what's possible. Okay, as I said before, effects can be at start, at end, and uh, they can increase, decrease, or assign the values of the primitive numeric assignments. So, for example, this, this effect assigns the value that's currently uh, the max fuel capacity to the value fuel. Okay, this is the, the match seller domain that I just showed you before. And here are the new parts, the, the new types, the duration, uh, the at start and at ends. Okay. And this was the plan. Well, this is the plan that I probably would have written. I, I didn't think to light both matches at once, but maybe I'm not as intelligent as the planner. I also decided to start fixing the fuse immediately after lighting the match rather than waiting three seconds and fixing the fuse at the very end. Uh, but the planner was procrastinating. Uh, but the actual constraints here are just that um, mend fuse has to begin after light match is true. And light match has been made true by this effect. The effects are in blue here, the conditions are in red. Light match is the at start effect of the light match action. So let's just go back to um, the PDDL editor for a moment. And take a look at this light match. So in order to light the map, to mend the fuse, I need my hands to be free. And at the start of the hand free action, uh, hand, the mend fuse action, hand free is made false. And at the end of the hand free action, uh, uh, mend fuse action, sorry, hand free is made true again. I mean, this wouldn't make much sense in classical PDL. It's making a fact false and true, but it's not happening at the same time because this is a durative action. Uh, so let's add this second goal and ask instead for the plan that mends both fuses. Okay, was that was that what everyone was expecting from the plan here? I'll be honest, I, I assumed that we'd light match one, mend fuse one, and then after the first match went out, I'd light the second match and begin uh, mending the fuse. But that's not what's happened here. Instead, the... Um, the planner has done its best to minimize the total duration of the plan and it's mended both fuses back to back uh, and just lit the matches in such a way as to cover that amount of time. It's interesting. I may go back to the 
discussion on optimality, which we can talk about later. Okay, finally, I, I want to uh, discuss a bit timed initial literals. So a timed initial literal is a way in which you can describe uh, something becoming true or false uh, at a time point that is not the initial state. So for example, here, uh, in the initial state, I could say at time 20, or I could put a real value in there if I want, that match becomes available, or at time 40, it, it becomes not available. This adds or deletes that fact from the state at that time point. Uh, so if I were to run the planner with these, um, with these uh, time initial littles, I would end up with a, a plan that looks like this. It's exactly the same plan, but it's been shifted 40 seconds forwards in time. Okay, so let's look again at um, how to use planning.domains with the temporal solver. The easiest way is to load one of the links um, in the uh, lab one PDF because there all of the temporal stuff has already been enabled. The plugins have already been enabled. In particular, you have the timeline viewer and you have the temporal planner. Uh, if you just load a fresh planning.domains page, what you'll need to do is go to the plugins menu and enable the timeline viewer yourself and also plug in the URL to the, uh, uh, to the temporal planner plugin, which is here. Uh, I think said so the easiest way is just to, to load one of the um, the links which already has that enabled. And that will allow you to tackle the last part of exercise four, which is this temporal logistics problem. So we have all of these waypoints which are now separated by edges with distance. So these are all locations and the numbers are the distance between those locations. You'll have to use PDL functions to describe those distances. There's a couple of drivers, there's a couple of trucks, and there's four packages. These are all the different objects of the domain. So something, their types might be in the domain file, but the, um, the actual objects will be listed in your problem file. And this is a description of the, the rules of the game. So these are the transitions that will be encoded into the operators in your domain file. I want packages to be able to be loaded into and unloaded from trucks, and I want that action to take 10 time units. I want drivers to be able to walk between connected waypoints at a speed of 0.5, to be able to get into and out of trucks, taking also 10 time units, and the trucks and drivers, the trucks with drivers in them, to be able to drive between connected waypoints at a speed of one. Now, there's a lot of things I've said here, which you'll have to actually make decisions about when it comes time to, to implement this in PDDL. So for example, can multiple drivers get into a single truck? Um, can you load and unload packages with a driver present or without a driver present? Um, anything that I've not specified is up to you, essentially. I don't mind, as long as these rules are um, applied. Um, part of exercise four is to improve this domain with a boat and a plane. Uh, it includes two new locations, the lighthouse and the sky. Uh, and the boat starts at the lighthouse and the plane starts in the sky. The boat travels at a speed of 1.5 and the plane travels at a speed of two and they don't need drivers to move. Uh, it's up to you whether or not drivers can get into those vehicles. Uh, moreover, the boat can only travel across the blue edge uh, from the lighthouse to waypoint seven. The plane can only travel along the orange edges between waypoint two, the sky and waypoint four. And the trucks can't travel across either of those. They can only travel across the black normal road edges. Okay, and this is the goal. It's just to deliver the packages to a waypoint nine, waypoint two and the lighthouse and both drivers must return to waypoint one. You'll note the trucks, the plane, the boat, it doesn't matter where they end up. That's not a part of the goal. So in fact, there are many, many states uh, in which this goal is still achieved. Okay, 
And as I mentioned at the beginning, some of you will already have some PDDL experience and this may sound a bit boring, so I've added some extra challenges here. Uh, first, each truck can make a maximum of seven trips. Uh, now, unfortunately, I didn't test whether it's possible to find a plan where each truck can only make a maximum of seven trips. So if you can prove that's unsolvable, then I'm very happy and you can uh, increase the number and find, in fact, what is the minimum number of trips per truck that is required to solve this problem. Uh, Another constraint you could try to add is that the plane must wait a minimum of 10, 20 time units between trips. This is a, sounds just as simple, but when you think about it, does that mean it has to apply an action called wait to reset itself between trips? Um, it's probably the easiest thing. Uh, the next challenge is that each driver must return to waypoint one and disembark at least once within each 400 time unit interval. It's beginning to get a little bit less um, obvious how these might be encoded. Uh, next, I'd like you to add fuel to trucks. I want them to consume uh, one unit of fuel for each time unit they're traveling and allow them to be refueled at uh, stations in waypoints three and nine. I didn't specify what the capacity of the truck is there, but you can make it something large enough that this is still possible to solve. Uh, and then to make things very frustrating. I'd like trucks to consume 0 0.1 fuel per time unit when they're not driving as well. And that's the hardest to encode, I think. Um, again, it's not the same as making the plane wait a minimum of 20 time units. Uh, because if, you, if I just said, well, there's a driving action and a not driving action, and the not driving action just consumes fuel, the plan is free not to apply the not driving action. It's free to wait between the driving and not driving actions some amount of time. So it's a little bit trickier to figure out how to, um, how to implement this. Now, someone mentioned before um, the 10 second timeout and the error message, there it is in the chat. These challenges probably will um, increase the complexity of the problem such that the online planner can't solve them before being timed out anymore. Uh, so you may well have to download and run the planner on your local machine instead. Uh, we'll see. Someone asked, can we model the maximum number of trips for a truck? Uh, on Using the online planner, you mean probably, probably. Uh, a very useful technique would be to actually prune away a lot of the problem, keep the domain the same, but make the problem much simpler, decrease the number of locations and packages. Add these constraints into your domain and test it on the smaller problem. And then once you're sure they're working, you can try them on the larger problem as well. And on a smaller problem, all of these will be possible. <laughs> 